We're in Aspen, Colorado, filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and I've been waiting for this uh, for quite a while now. We're filming with Jake Hanna, one of the great jazz drummers and conversationalists. Conversationalists, yes. I love your name, Monk. Uh, I'm going to start using that name, Monk Rowe. I've been using Sneed Hearn for years, but uh, well, Monk Rowe, that's a hell of a name. I, well, I never heard a name like that. He's, it works. Not only as Monk was far up, but Monk Rowe is. I'll be That's expecting uh, some checks in the mail, though, if you oh, start to good. do that. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. yeah, good. I'll, I'll send you back yours and bounce to me if I bounce back to you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Sound like a basketball. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. going to read something here. All right. Okay, that you told to a very famous lady. Uh, you had three childhood heroes. Brace Beamer. Brace Beamer, the Lone Ranger. Benny? Ross Tompkins knows him. Okay, yeah. Benny Goodman. BG, yeah. And Ted Williams. Big Ted, yeah. Now, what happened to Brace? Brace Beamer? passed away. I think he moved to Florida. Ro yeah, he moved to Florida, because Ross Tompkins' father knew him in Detroit. And I, th I think he died. <laughs> I think he took over that Lone Ranger show. We should tell our viewers who, who he was in case Well, he played the part of the Lone Ranger. He actually produced the show originally, I think. Somebody else played the Lone Ranger. They all started leaving and doing something, going yeah. to some other. So he just took over the role, plus the... Plus the show, you know. Yeah. Yeah, he's a very popular guy, I guess. You know, part of the Lone Ranger played by Bra by your announcer, Brace Beamer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, I don't know how they did it. Maybe two guys did the whole show. Who knows? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, of course, Ted Williams. Ted, I mean, oh, the we best. Yeah, the best. King of Swing. <laughs> a real King, king of Swing. swing. Right, I'll tell you, he was really something. Yeah, I liked him because he was like a salmon, you know, like Buddy Rich. He swam upstream. <laughs> Everything was coming against him, and the, the press was 100% against him. I mean, not the press, but... Guy named Parker, Colonel Dave Parker, from the real bad in Apple. Uh -huh. And uh, Ted just fought them all and no won. Kidding. And won, beat them all down. Yeah, just single handed, you know, yeah. just fantastic. They pulled a shift on him, you know, it's still the most ferocious shift ever pulled on any ball player. They had one for Stanley Musial, too, it was a hell of a hitter, too. But uh, they all did, everybody's over this part. All the fans, everybody got over one side of the field. <laughs> the, the dogs, the cats, the, uh, the guys that sold the hot dogs, they all got over one side. <laughs> Mandela, Tootsie Mandela's father was a hot dog salesman out there. He, he got over the on the right side. And he hit against him. They threw him. Uh -huh. Who the hell wants to see him, see him hit to, over there, you know, yeah. the left field? But he did, uh, one time they were playing Cleveland and they all pulled over him. He popped one over the left field wall, which is a very short fence anyway. Uh -huh. he, he said, he's walking around, see, I can do that any time I want. He said, yeah, we know that, you know, Bob Lemon. <laughs> Bob Lemon tells the story. He could hit the left any time he wanted, but who, who would go to see him, you know? I want to see Superman. That's what he was, Superman. <laughs> well, and Benny Goodman. He was PG, a, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, was, he was great. Yeah, great. He never cared for me, but uh, geez, I heard some fantastic things he's done, you know. Still, even now, you, see, you bring back some old things he did. My wife and I were listening to him on a tape, 1935, Magna 38, with Gene, Teddy. They added the vibes later, but it was much better as a trio. It really was. They could do whatever they wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. Never had to worry about getting the keys right in the middle of the songs. Just look at Teddy, Teddy look at him, and they knew just what they're doing. We're trying the same thing with uh, Kenny Poplowski and Johnny Varro and myself, but we rarely get together. When we do, it's very exciting. Yeah. Very exciting, yeah. They're great. Is it, the guys are great. Uh, how does it change your playing to work without a bass player? Well, you adjust your playing. Sometimes I just leave the hi-hat off, and I just play off the snare, and the bass uh -huh. drum stays very steady. You gotta retune it where it gets a nice, nice, nice tone. Oh. And it all depends on that piano player. See? Could have a nice, loose lift. Yeah. Can't be pounding. It'd be nice, boom, bang, like Teddy could play, you know. It's yeah. only one Teddy Wilson. And that's Johnny Varro. Mm -hmm. So they, <laughs> but that's, Johnny's very good at it. So yeah. we, and Ralph Sutton. Uh -huh. We have a good time, easy time with Ralph, and we have an easy time with the John Bunch. And Dave McKenna, he's born for that. Dave McKenna yeah. is the king of that stuff. In fact, he doesn't need us. <laughs> so, so that's what the hell with Dave, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, my. Well, you're a Boston, uh, raised in Boston. Yeah, Dorchester, yeah, Dorchester yeah. Mass, yeah. And uh, Stanley Specter. Stanley was around Boston, yeah. He, he eventually moved to New York. I studied a little bit with Stanley. Not that long. He just got my reading, sort of got my reading up a little bit, which I never bothered with, because you can't see the notes, what the hell, what the hell's the use of reading, you know. I still have to play by ear, and I hate playing with big bands anymore. They're just overwritten, you know, the arrangers Over are taking everything. It's like watching a movie where the cameraman is now the director, you know? What kind of a movie is that, you know? Hmm. Jesus. I had a friend who was a movie actor, Jimmy Flavin from 
Portland, Maine, you know, you've seen a lot of them. He's, he's, he's made a, four movies a day sometimes, you know, for the Warner Brothers. Yeah, you know, <laughs> two seconds here, one minute there. Go over and do Mildred, Mildred Pierce for me. Okay, what do I have to do? Just say uh, guilty or something. <laughs> then you go over and do, uh, uh, what was the other one he was in? Made four in one day. You know. But they're only short parts. He, uh, uh -huh. uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy, and he just looked up and said, it's a boy, okay, that's it. <laughs> then he gets, gets out of the fireman's uniform and goes over and plays the detective. No, no kidding. Yeah. And he don't do that thing for Laura. Okay, we'll do that one with Laura. He stands on the sidewalk. And that's it. He does very famous character actor, Jimmy. Contract player to come. Yeah. But uh, that's, the, you know, <laughs> uh, anyway, go ahead. Well, we were so, talking about uh, actually how you got started in uh, big bands, but Woody Herman was your first... Uh, no, big Ted band. Weems was my Ted first Weems. big band. Yeah, Ted Weems was. And then uh, played a very good band after that. Buddy Morrow had a very good band when I worked with him. It was way better than Woody's band that he had at the time. Yeah, very good. Kenny Poplowski worked with Buddy. And he said the same. He's just a great guy to work with and mm -hmm. always had a good band. But the band I was with was Dave on piano and, uh, and uh, Dick Johnson on alto and Ray DeCio. I had a guy, Rick Davis, very good tenor player. We had a very good band, a very good band. And we played the rhythm and blues book, you know. Yeah. But I forget, I forget what the tune was. Night Train, naturally, that was his most famous record. Sure. And a lot of other, other, other tunes, Red yeah. Top, things like that. Yeah. But a big band arrangers, they were fun to play, you know, fun to play. At what age were you uh, inclined to think that, hey, maybe I can make a living as a drummer? Well, I never did anything else. So I never thought of it. Never thought of it. Just loved it. You know, I never thought of ever doing anything else, you know, mm -hmm. ever. I just loved it, you know. Even when I went to service, I figured, well, I'll go in, I'm be a gunner, you know. But they eliminated gunners, you know, in the 50s. They eliminated, oh. everything was electronic. And uh, they come up with the jets then, jets were invented, so they, they, <laughs> they wouldn't let me go to handle the gun anyway, you know. But they, uh, uh, you, you played a musical instrument, they pull you right in a, you know, a band flight. Mm -hmm. And if you're a doctor or medicine, they pulled you right into that area and gave you a commission. You can't train a musician in four years. Just take somebody off the street. Say, all right, you're in the service. Oh, you're gonna. Be, we need two drummers over here. You're gonna. Forget it. You can't train a guy. You say, who plays the drum? You do over here. Uh, as a doctor, we can't train a doctor in four years. So you're automatically in when you go in. You're, that's automatically what you do. Most people, they can train you. Infantry. That's true. Everybody I, shoot a gun. You know. I never even thought of yeah, that. Yeah. No, way. they have to have specialists, and you got to go right away. They can train guys with dot and dashes and radio people. They can get that done in six months. You know. Mm -hmm. But not a musician play a march and then play a little symphony and then play a little dance job and play a show. In fact, most musicians can't do all that, you know? <laughs> really. That's, that's you know, true. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to play during your service. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, in fact, I went in to do that. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't good enough to play outside. Got out of high school, I really didn't know how to do anything. So I said, I'll go into service, see if I get in the band, you know, took a chance. Lloyd Morales, a friend of mine, a drummer, he got me into the band because I couldn't read, you know. And eventually I learned to read off of trumpet parts and things. And the guys in the new band I was with in Texas, they showed me how to read. And quick, I learned to read a couple of days, really. You went right out of the service into some, a group in Texas and... Uh, I went out and I went down with Tommy Reed's band. Uh-huh. Heard you made a lot of money there. Oh. hundred a week. What was it? What did it pay? No, no, no. It paid 90 a week. 90 a week. Sorry. 90. <laughs> uh, maybe 60. Maybe it was 60 a week. And then I went to 95 and worked at a Statler chain. Uh, but it was always broke, you're always broke. And I went with Ted Weems right after that. Uh-huh. And we had a good time with him. He was a great guy, great guy. She, he was just the nicest guy I ever met. Funny. Real funny, real loose. Were uh, you playing? He and Woody were the funniest guys I ever worked for. Yeah? Yeah. He was real funny, this guy. Very nice, warm-hearted guy. You know? Uh-huh. Very, quite a modern band. Besides the hard thing we had to do every night, he had very, very mild, pretty good arrangers. He kept the band right up. Uh, besides the what thing you had to do every night? Heartaches? Is that what you said? Heartaches. That was his big hit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that was his uh, real big hit. Yeah, yeah, from okay. the 30s, yeah. That's right. Oh, he's still playing it. That's what kept him in business. Uh huh. That's now different from some of the rock and roll guys oh. who, who. Well, Woody Herman had to play the Woodchopper's Ball every night. Right. Yeah, we played Carnegie Hall one night, and he said, Did you notice something tonight at the 40th anniversary? I said, No. We got away without playing a woodchopper's ball. Jesus, he's the first time he's ever been able to do it in about 30, 40 years, you know. Wow, on the yeah, anniversary that's something? concert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I, uh, I was reading a little bit that Marion McPartland wrote a whole chapter 
you know, about you. Yeah, That's she's great. a terrific kid. She's nice. great. One of the best people I ever worked with. One yeah. of the most enjoyable times of my life. Yeah. You told her that in uh, late 59, you're playing in Storyville with Buck Clayton and Jimmy Rushing. Yes, that's right. That's right. There's Jimmy, here's a singer, Buck, Vic Dickinson, Pee Wee Russell, Bud Freeman. That was the forefront line. Mm -hmm. And Lou Carter, myself, or sometimes George Ween, myself, and Champ Jones, who worked for the police department. And the other band was the Jerry Mulligan uh, Quartet with Art Farmer, played uh, trumpet, and uh, Billy Crow and Dave Bailey. You know, Dave Bailey wound up being a pilot for F. Lee Bailey, who was a flyer himself. I'm kidding. Yeah, 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 he was a pilot for him. He was one of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh -huh. that's, that's what Dave was. Was that a, a particularly significant gig for you? Yeah, yeah. It was so good. I was walked into work one night. I'd been in there with an year old day. I'd been there with the Hilos. I'd been there with Lambert, Andrews, and Ross. You name it. I was there with these people. You need a road day. I walked into work one night and Sammy Margolis is sitting at the bar and says, you playing drums in this job, Jake? I said, yeah, I am, Sammy. Yeah. It's going to change your life. I said, you think so? He says, yeah, it's going to shoot you off in another direction. You'll never play that corny bebop stuff again. You know? I said, you think so? I says, yeah, okay, get up. And boy, was he right. That Buck Clayton was so easy to play with and comfortable. And Pee Wee was great, a lot of laughs. And Bud Freeman was great. And Vic Dickinson was one of the greatest of all uh -huh. time. It was so easy, I didn't have to do anything, you know? They just played it for us. Oh, this is how it's supposed to go. Oh, Everybody's supposed to contribute. Mm -hmm. Not like that battling and battling as a Maynard, you know, and guys run up and down trombones and all that. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, this it, is this I, is great. I find it curious a fellow called called Bebop Corny. Because Yeah, they would get pretty corny, those guys. Not Charlie Parker. Jeez, I mean yeah. he was a monster, a carny condoli. Have you heard Gonti? Yeah. I mean, it's phenomenal. But most of the bop guys were corny, man. You know, they didn't swing or anything. Mm. It sounded like they didn't know what they were doing. And I don't think they did. Oh, these guys were superb, you know, superb. Look, these guys play what they call bop, I guess, with Sonny Berman and Red Rodney. It's just a superb players. But the, the other guys that play the, the bop thing I was associated with was corny, man, corny. It was awful. Jeez. Well, you eventually went and played uh, with Marion. Yeah, well, I years. went into swing music forever. I never went back to the, to the bebop thing. Uh -huh. Never went back to it. That's it, huh? I never yeah. went back. You know, I went out with Marion. Uh, right after that, I went out with her a trio for years. I was at the Hickory House for years with Toshiko, you know. I was Maynard Ferguson and Birdland and things like that. Once I got with these guys, that was it. I was then I headed for John Bunch and those Count Basie. <laughs> and play with Count, the little combos, you know. Oh, it was a good day, McKenna. And after Marion, I went right with uh, Bobby Hackett. Yeah. They hired me when we were in Ohio. He says, Get back to New York, you come over and work at Condit with us. Pay way more on you know, any day to work with McKenna, you know. Beautiful. Then we had a Bob Wilbur and Cutty Cutch. Well, not we always had that good quartet, you know. Yeah. Well, do you know what it was about your playing that they liked? Don't know. Don't care as long as they hired me. Yeah. Don't try to analyze it. No, I don't <laughs> analyze it at all. No, not at all. Well, you said, to me, freedom is gained through limiting your playing disciplining yourself. Some modern drummers don't play with license. They play with them. <laughs> reckless abandon, I guess they call it. <laughs> Reck, uh, arthritic abandon, that's what they call it, artistic. Arthritic abandon. Oh, they're just too busy. Too much noise going on, you know. Mm -hmm. You eliminate all that and you get that right, good, good feeling, you're right with the bass, get the piano player to stay out of the way, that horn player's got a chance. Now, if he starts playing too busy, get another horn player, you know. Uh -huh. You hear the difference. Kenny Devrin starts playing, man, at times starts Swinging, you know. Yeah. Man, he's not swinging, man. Very precise. Very. You got to think about it. Woody Herman says it's not that easy to explain. Just don't fluff it off like saying, hey, you're swinging, you don't. It isn't that easy, you know. You have to think about the thing. To concentrate. A lot of concentration. Mm -hmm. Well, I really enjoyed listening uh, last night because I noticed that as, as each horn player got to do their thing, that you would vary what you were doing. Yeah, like, I'd slow down a speed up either. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get people's attention. <laughs> oh yeah, get attention. Drown them out, get too loud here, too loud. Yeah, sure, yeah. All, now, the, all the guys here have a very good time, you know. Uh, Joe Templey is fantastic. Yeah. You know, he's really a hell of a player, that guy. I know, but you, yeah. you'd move from sticks to brushes yeah. to hands. You know, whatever it took. Oh, that was a little solo I know, but, thing I but did. But I yeah, noticed, you know, yeah, when you're playing behind, behind Dan that you're 
that you added some muscle, and when it got to the piano solo, that you went way down. Yeah. Just you well, know, piano nice. players. <laughs> Get her and Ralph. I mean, yeah. that's that's child, two Charles Appleses in a row right yeah. there. That's strong player there. You know? yeah. Ross Tompkins got it all down. You know, that's strength. You know, Ralph doesn't need anybody. He needs Dave. That entity. You know, mm -hmm. they're phenomenal. Those guys. So instead of trying to uh, battle with their strength, you let oh. them take. Oh yeah, yeah. Follow them. Just join in. Have a ball. Uh -huh. It's like playing with Count Basie. Just join in. There's nothing to it with him. You know. He was the easiest guy. Teddy Wilson, another guy, very easy to play mm -hmm. with. Very easy to play with. Just tag along, man. That's all. Have a ball. Enjoy his music. I was a customer to him, you know, a paid customer. I sit there and I play the brush so no other idiot drummer could get up there and screw him up. I just play very simple behind him. Yeah. And a bit Donald was very good with him, and Joe Jones, of course, was absolutely phenomenal with Teddy. But then again, Joe tried to take over that one too, you know. Mm -hmm. That's why the basic got rid of him. That's why Teddy had to get rid of him. Too bad, you know. His ego yeah, he was, was the best. He was the best of them all. I guess. Was his ego? The, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Joe was, no, he was not a shy guy. Uh -huh. He was not shy at all. Not shy like you. <laughs> no, no, not shy. He was a very good pal of mine. Six days a week I'd hang with that guy. Oh my, the list goes on and on. You played with Ellington and that was just a sub for Harry Sam. James. That's, I was yeah. only ten days or two. That's yeah. sub for Sam. To now you made Sam. a comment that that you felt you didn't play good with Ellington because no, you I didn't were listening play well to at all with that thing. No, I didn't play yeah. well at all with that. Especially when Duke was conducting, he goes like this, you know. He looks like a knuckleball pitcher up there. You don't know when he's gonna let when he's gonna let the and then the band would just start coming in. I don't know what he was doing. When Harry Carney beat up the temple, I sound like a million bucks with those guys. Ah. You know, he just go one, two, three, four, and man, in you go. But Duke was like a man, a whirling dervish up there. What's he doing, man? What's he doing? He said, Oh, don't worry, Harry'll get the temple for you, you know. And then Harry would bring me in, but if Harry wasn't beating the time off, I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Oh, Keeping my. a sharp eye on uh, Ray Nance, you know, Ray Bing. That's his one, okay? Here we go. But I was not successful with it, man. No, mm. I was successful with Woody. I was, did okay with Harry James. Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, tell me about uh, in the 60s, you moved out to L.A. in, uh, in what, in 70? 70. But before that, you got into the, uh, the day. Merv Griffin. Yeah, oh, yeah I, got, I joined Merv in about 65. I left Woody in World Series 64. Cardinals, Yankees, Reno, Nevada, 64. Then uh, watched Wait a the minute. first Wait two games minute. there, then took a day off, flew back to New York and cut the next three games. And then uh, I bet on the Cardinals, and they won it that year, too. They did. They, they won it. Yeah. Was Stan Musial playing then? No, though, this no, is sick. No, Stanley this was not playing then. Uh, Kenny uh, Boyer was playing. He was uh -huh. a big gun. Kenny Boyer, yeah. the, uh, short and third, yeah. yeah. Short. Okay. No, he was a great player. The <laughs> yeah, they had a good team. They had a good team. Forget it's the announcer now is playing. And, uh, uh, forget his name. He's announcing the World Series now. You know, oh. He was catching for him. Oh, what the heck is his name? Tim McCarver. He, he was with him, yeah. Yeah, he was good. Tim was a good player, yeah. Well, how'd you like working steady thing, uh, every t TV show every day? Oh, I hated it. Just hated it. And then he went out to coast and he tripled us the money. You know, the money was lousy in New York, believe it or not. And went out to coast. He, he, he more than tripled it. You know, so we made good money out there. But it was even worse. You know, I mean, it was awful. I mean, it's, 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 it's a sunny and share world out there on that uh, television. Uh -huh. You know, it's just the people with no, no ability at all and no talent at all. You know, look at. Did you happen to watch the thing the other day, Quincy Jones trying to teach <laughs> Bruce Springsteen and this guy that's big, that write the poet singer, what the hell's his name? Uh, oh, jeez, he's uh, 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 Dylan. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan Bob yeah. Dylan. Trying to show him a song. I mean, these guys, well, you might as well try to talk to that wall to get these guys to hear. They're totally deaf. Uh. It was the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen. I'm like, Honey, come in here. Watch this. And she, my wife started laughing. I started laughing. We called up people. Just watch the television. Watch these two idiots. You know, these are the billionaires. Billionaires. These guys. They can't do anything. God, they were awful. You know. And poor Quincy just. Oh, okay, fine. I'll let the blue fellows. You know. We'll just do it your way. He showed them the melody. They just couldn't get the melody. And so he said, "Well, sing what you're singing, man. That'll that'll be the melody." You know. Oh. Poor Quincy. <laughs> He's dealt with these fools for years. And. Phil Ramone is in with him too, you know, he's the best sound engineer yeah. that there is. I don't know what he's doing with these guys, making a lot of money, I guess. But he was he did a lot of great stuff with Woody, you know. Yeah. It's great stuff. He's a hell of a nice guy too. But uh, yeah, it was awful that stuff they're doing. Mm. And that's what used to appear on the show all the time. 
you know, Monty Rock the Third, you know. <laughs> God, <laughs> with like, uh, the loving spoonful, and there was another couple of other. Peter and something or other on there, no, no, when a Rob Beetle thing was going Peter on. Peter and Chad and Jeremy, Peter and uh, Gordon, like Peter and Gordon. Peter and Gordon, oh man, I mean, these, it was awful, you know. God. And you got to, you had, had to, to play, play behind oh, them. Oh, yeah, and you had to uh, no, that's too, we, and, you know, he says, well, don't try to fix it up, fella, just, Trumpet player says, just play it as bad as they want it. I told you it wasn't going to be fun, you know. <laughs> and she says, this is all, all. Then Benny Goodman would come on and be fine, you know. Count Basie come on, that was a great show. Bill Watrous got him to come on, Trump will play. Uh -huh. Who else is that? Who was in the, 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 this pit, the show, the, the band? band? New York, we had Billy Watrous, Danny Styles, Bill Berry. Then we'd added, like, uh, Ziggy Harrell and Roy Eldridge. And in sax, we had Roger Pemberton, Dick Hafer, the tenor. Shelly Gold, Richie Kamuka. Then uh, Richie would take, I would always add Zoot Sims or Al Cohn. Then Jim Hall was a guitar. And he took off with Jim Rainey or somebody like that. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy refused to play any of this rock and roll stuff with Sonny, and he refused to do it. So they brought in another guy. So now we have two guitars, Chuck Wayne and Jim Hall. Chuck Wayne refused to play. <laughs> now we got two guys refused to play this stuff. So you never heard so many bossa novas in your life with two guitar players going on. <laughs> That's how we got around it, you know. It was just awful. Art Davis, bass, and myself, and uh -huh. uh, Martin Lindsay was a band leader. Oh, Trombone, yeah, Watrous and Brooke Meyer. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> it was a crazy man. Out the West Coast, we used different, we had different guys. They had Herbie Ellis and Ray Brown, myself. That was a rhythm. And uh, Jack Sheldon was put on, and uh, Pete Condoli. Yeah, Bill Berry. Had a nice, uh, had a nice band, a nice band. Yeah, nine Jimmy. years you did that. Yeah, nine, nine and a half years, years yeah, almost ten years. Wow. Jimmy Cleveland was with us out there. Guy Windy. Very, very good heavyweight band. It was one of the best on television ever. But uh, playing nonsense. But you, so you put four or five hours a day into that show. Oh yeah. 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 You're able to play, uh, get out and do other well, things. Well, you, you go to work at three, you get off at eight. So what's this? Yeah, five hours a day. Yeah. But then you, was there a jazz scene in L.A. that you could tap into at that time? Well, Dante's was going in. They, yeah, a lot of the guys worked that place for nothing, you know. Oh. 25 bucks a night if you wanted cash. If you wanted to get a check, you could you'd get 35, but you probably wouldn't check probably bounce. <laughs> it was, well, that's how silly it is, you know. Joe Pass used to work, you know, the best guy, you know. He's written novel, but Red was there, you'd get money, you know. Or uh, basic, I mean, a zoo, you better work with zoo or Red. But hardly, I hardly ever worked there with anyone else. Some of the sluggers come in, Russ Tompkins, or Teddy Wilson would always ask if he could have me, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was okay. I pay nothing, you know. Yeah. Pay nothing. The uh, couple times the subject has come up about playing. On the beat, on top of the beat, playing behind the beat. Does such a thing exist? For well, if you play on top, you rush. If you play uh, <laughs> behind, you drag. See? <laughs> if the rhythm did that, if they laid back, they'd be dragging. See, the Trump band, I was well going to lay back. And was, well, we'll join you. Was, oh, no, no, we'll slow down. And that was everybody play right in tempo, like Count Basie does. He said, well, Basie's band, uh, they lay back. I said, no, they don't. Play the records and hear the rhythm drop out. They go swinging straight ahead. Basie never allowed that. You know, we always had Sweet Setters and Buck Clayton, and they were right on the money, man. Snooky Young, uh -huh. best, you know, best. Oh, Lester Young, <laughs> you know, who's better than those guys? You know, <laughs> those guys are right on time, man. They don't lay back at a beat. Uh -huh. They're dragging, that's all that is. You can't get swinging if you do that. You can't get swinging if you double time the, the medium tempos either. Those guys were always swinging. They was always swinging. They were right on the money, right on time. You've played on... Uh Hundreds of records, I would think. I only get paid for a couple, though. A couple of them. <laughs> Still get those uh, royalty checks coming no. in. No. Oh, I do from some of the Concord stuff. Yeah. Oh, we signed that deal years ago, but we didn't get much in front to do it. In fact, I make it more now than I made then. Uh -huh. On occasion, you know. On occasion. But I got some good guys with that company. <clears throat> Carl Fatana, you know, but we only made one record. But it sold very big. It's one of his, one of his better selling records. Rose Clooney, uh -huh. Crosby, Bing Crosby, 
I got them all on one record. Got Woody, Bing, Tony, Rosemary, all on one record. Plus, it was Scott Hamilton's very first record date with him. First record date he ever made. Yeah. He Not was uh, yeah, around 19 or something? No, he's 22. Uh -huh. yeah. I was listening to some old Woody Herman things we did in 1962. Sal Nistico was 22 years old then, too. Man, what was he wailing? Monster. Ooh, 22 years old. I couldn't believe this guy. Monster. Was uh, life on the road uh, a hassle? Was it hard? Oh, yeah. But you, that's when you used to look forward to going to the gig, you know? I thought it was great. But Harry James, it was very easy. He had the nice bus, the nice thing, everything was taken care of. But you never looked forward to going to the job, you know? Who do you remember? You look forward to going to a job if you could find it. If all the band could find it at one time, you know. The money was never there and all that, but who cared? It was terrific music. Uh -huh. Very exciting music. It set the world on fire there for about a year. But uh, without a band, it's very comfortable. Nothing happened. No, uh -huh. no, nothing ever happened. Who was the rhythm section uh, with the Herman Band? With the well, first time? when I was there, there was only three guys. We were there forever. Nat Pierce, Chuck Anderson, me. They're both dead now. Chuck mm -hmm. just died a few months ago. But that's all it was, is three guys. We, mm -hmm. we never changed. And when I left, they stayed the same. Ronnie Zito came in. So they stayed the same then. Yeah. Did they call that the second herd? No, they just called it the swinging herd. The that's swinging herd. Swinging herd. <laughs> Bill Ch have a nucleus. Bill Chase, Sal, myself, and uh, <clears throat> Nat, no, Chuck. That's all we had. Yeah. We had about four or five nucleus. If we could keep Sal all the time. It's hard to keep him in the band, you know. But if he was there, he was a man, he was a clean up hitter, you know. He was a Babe Ruth. Yeah. Yeah. He was the attraction, really. He was the attraction. Upstate New York guy, wasn't he? And there's some yeah, good players Syracuse, that came out of there. Yeah. Syracuse, yeah. Romano so and the and the, oh, the wise guys, the upstate upstarts, yeah. Yeah. There's Menza, Romano. He's the biggest wise guy of them all. And he had Larry Cavalli, Sal. I mean, they were real great. I was Sammy Noto. I mean, they were real. So, so this is going. Joe Romano, rather, he's a real wise guy. He's working yeah. with Gap Man Joni, Chuck's Chuck older, older brother, you know. Yeah. Playing the piano, and Gap is playing the piano. Joe takes the handkerchief and he throws it right across the keyboard like this while he's playing. He says, What the hell is that for? He says, Illegal use of the hand. <laughs> he's a real wise guy. <laughs> so, so then he says, Watch out, man. I used to be a fighter, you know. He says, well, take the boxing gloves off when you're working with me, huh? It's, it's, <laughs> oh. Don't you spread the top, Joe. <laughs> you might as well keep your mouth just let him do. He used to do that to Buddy Rich. <laughs> of all people, you know, Buddy Rich come right back at him. But those two guys were funny. You're in the trailer, something in the back rooms. And listen, those guys, you know, they were funny, man. Boy, they were funny. Man, Buddy oh, loved man. loved him. Jeez, Buddy Rich loved Joe Romano. Anybody who's a real quick wit, he loved, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but Joe could blow, you know. Joe's a hell of a player. Yeah, sure. You just can't be funny, and you gotta, you gotta play, too. Like, Buddy could play like a demon. Mm -hmm. But he's a very funny guy, you know. <laughs> he's, he's a great guy. Great. That's interesting. I didn't know anybody had the nerve to uh, to try to top Buddy Rich. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. There's a guy named Jimmy Mosier was with him, too. Buddy's getting so mad, he throw the sticks at him. But Jimmy always had a funny line, funny comeback. Nothing you could do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he's, they were funny guys, man. Oh, yeah. Really oh, man. Guys. You played with Super Sax. Uh, yeah, Super Sax. That's right. I was with them. I made a, lot of, a couple of albums with them. Yeah. Three or four albums. They called me to come back and do another one. They had Lawrence Marble, who's a very good drummer, but uh, they were doing fast tunes, you know. Lawrence is not quite up in that stuff. And they had to add trumpets, voices, and a big orchestra, and plus the Super Sax. Plus, they're doing the old things. See? And uh, Don Lamont called me up one day and says, I rather Ray Brown. Ray Brown calls him and says, gee, how do you know when you've had it, you know, when you when they get off like a fighter, never knows when he's yeah. had it. And they always quit too late. He says, how do you know when you do that in our business, Jake? Says, gee, I don't know. I'm not ready to get through yet. Well, they did these old tunes. We've done the original records. We had to do some of them. I started repeating myself. I couldn't get any more new things going. And I, I called Ray the next day. I says, I think it's time for me to get off this stuff. <laughs> and I just played, then I explained to him what we did. We did some old stuff. Redid some old stuff, and man, I couldn't get it. I couldn't make it at all, you know. Couldn't hear it, you know. I think it's time for me to get off, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> time to retire. He says, yeah, I do the same thing. I have a lot of trouble with that stuff. Stuff I could do years ago is I can't do anymore. You know? Listened to a thing the other day. My wife played an old record, uh, Caledonia Apple Honey, we did live, and it's... About that tempo. You know? And man, I'm playing it. Hands of, I played that on 4-4 when I played on that band with 16 guys, and 
Man, I didn't get through eight bars of that thing. Yeah? No. I'm kidding. No. I gotta start practicing, you know. Someone said something about you in the Herman band is that, that when you were with them, they could play tempos that they had never been able to play oh, before. Oh, Woody, yeah, Woody said that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was the only difference between me and the other guy, Dave and Don. He said, well, we can play any tempo with Jake. Yeah, actually, play any tempo with uh, Don, too, you know. He can play any tempo with Don Lamont. He's mm -hmm. phenomenal. He's the greatest big band drummer of all time for my money. And with Dave, he had two tempos. He, he, he'd either come down into one or go up into the other. And once he got there, you never heard anything like that. But otherwise, you had, Dave, you had to get there. Dave, Dave Tuff, Tuff you're talking about? He had to glide into one tempo or go down into... He had two favorite tempos, and he'd bring that band into one of those things by about the, by about the second chorus. It was roaring, you know, uh -huh. once he got this time right there. He was phenomenal. Like that. That's the hardest swinging drummer I ever heard. Mm. I never heard a guy swing that hard. Yeah, Woody said, Jake is the first great big band drummer to come along since Dave Tuffman died. Oh, yeah? Wow. Yeah. That's all right. I, I like Woody a little better now. Yeah. So I don't mind him beating anyway. me out of that money. I don't mind that. It's worth it. It's worth it if he said that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather have the money, but anyway, I'm glad he did. Because he didn't have the money to pay anyway. What the hell? He was, he yeah, was broken than I was. <laughs> we didn't know that, though. You know? Oh, that Jeez. poor guy had some problems, didn't oh, he? Oh, those people were merciless, those IRS. They're finally going after the IRS. It's about time. Mm -hmm. Oh, they can get real mean, you know. Okay, so if you had a drum student, could you define uh, what it is to swing? First thing I'd do if I had a drum student, I'd send him right over to Snooky Young and let's sit down on the drums and play along with Snooky Young and show him how to phrase. Mm -hmm. Snooky Young knows just how to phrase those big band figures. Then I'd show him the technique, I'd send him to Dick Shanahan show them the technical part, how to move the hands right, you know. And then get rid of them. <laughs> In other words, you'd be a subcontractor. Too. Yeah, I'd be a, that's what I'd do, yeah. But I would show them how, to, how the hand moves when you play time, show them how to define that. And that's it. I wouldn't bother with too much else, you know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't bother with the reading because you get play better like this off your reflex. If you get mm -hmm. reflexes. If you don't have the reflexes, better yourself shows, you know, really. Got to have those reflexes. Like an athlete, a ball player, Ted Williams. He hit so well, so old. Kept his reflexes up. Uh -huh. yeah, he hit higher average than any old guy ever played baseball. A phenomenal guy. <laughs> you know, you go, a friend of mine died here. Not a friend of mine, old, one of my favorite players, Johnny Vandermeer. He used to pitch for the Reds, you know. Yeah, a friend of my mother was an umpire. In fact, he was the president of the Umpire Association. He umped one of those games. Where he pitched two no-hitters in a row. Oh, that's right. The only I guy in that. history only to do guy that. In history. Yeah, and I met Tom Holmes and his wife, Vivian, on a ship, and we hung out with my wife and I hung out with him. He played in one of those games. He, he saw one of those games. Says, "This guy was just wild enough to keep you off the plate, so you couldn't dig in against him." You know, he's sort of <laughs> crazy guy had in the mouth, and he was just wild enough and enough control of these two games in a row, one against the Braves and one against the Dodgers, that he pitched two no hitters in a row. Man, nobody even come close to that. Yeah, that's a, but, but he's a mediocre pitcher otherwise. You're pitching with a lousy team, you know. Uh -huh. The only wow. teams in those days were the Dodgers and the Cardinals. That's it. The National League. Mm -hmm. They were the only two teams, yeah. You still a baseball fan? Oh, yeah. I still like it. Yeah, I'm enjoying the series. I like the good pitching, but boy, I guess the Braves got overrated against these guys down there. Mm -hmm. I think that guy's managing a very good series. Yeah. Leland, I think he really knows what very he's doing. He always did, even when he was a pitcher. He knows what he was doing, that guy. Well, I wanted to ask you about a story I read uh, from Bill Crow. Actually, <laughs> Bill Crow, he's a beautiful guy. He was talking about a New Year's Eve gig that you played with Ralph. Ralph Sutton. Oh, right here. Yeah. Oh, right here, here, up the street. Up it the street. In... Yeah, Sunny's Rendezvous. We went by it Sunny. today. Hey, you walk downstairs. It's still there. Yeah. I don't know what they call it now. It's still there. And Lucky this a pizza joint now. This but... particular New Year's Eve. Something happened in uh, Yeah, well, Ralph. we can't say that on the TV. But yeah, was, we can. Ralph was, uh, well, you know, Ralph, he's always like a killjoy. The people, he can't stand the people. And they all get the hot hats ready to go and, and go you know, like, like this, you know. Yeah. And the whistles, and the, they're starting up this stuff, and about quarter to 12, they're starting this noise in the joint. And the, so Ralph comes out about 10 minutes to 12, or five minutes to 12, he's, he goes in a New Year's Eve song, whatever, that old Lang Syne. 
and people are what? And he's already taking another five or ten minutes. He goes into that and gets off the stand about five minutes or twelve and leaves these people sitting there. He never came back till about quarter past twelve. You know, they had to celebrate New Year's by themselves. You know, and they're going like this. The people, yeah, happy New Year's. All they said, yeah, happy New Year's. They had another ten minutes. And then, he's telling, and then, and then Ralph was doing this. I held up the big, big sign like this. A communism, it says. Red, white, and blue. <laughs> And it, it was given to me by Cal Jader. Remember Cal Jader? Cal Jader. Yeah. He gave me that thing. <laughs> so I said, well, I might as well put it to use. Fuck the commies. Screw the commies. And we get the big well, commies. There's a big red, white, and blue sign with the stripes and the star stripes. <laughs> That's what I said. Jesus. Ralph was in a star. He just get off the stand. He left these poor people to fend for themselves. <laughs> well, we worked on New Year's and with Ralph, Jack, and myself over in Germany. They flew us over for it, you know. Gave us a lot of money. Two G's for the night, you know, Pete. <laughs> My wife over first class, great. I had to come back to go up to uh, Taos, New Mexico, to work a thing up there, you know, for a couple of weeks. So I had to come right back. I flew over, played, and came right back. The other guys stayed there for two weeks, mm -hmm. treated like kings, you know. We went there, and the Germans, they stop at 12, at uh, 11.30, and you all hang out, and you dine, and you eat, and New Year's goes right by. Ah. And that's how they celebrate their New Year's. These particular guys did anyway. They're very, very wealthy guys. Yeah. You know, very wealthy. Yeah, they were from, I mean, from the 30s and 40s, right through the war, they were wealthy. Yeah. And they, uh, and that's how they celebrate uh, their, new, their New Year's Eve. They just stop. And they all sit and eat little shrimps and little deli, very, ex very expensive, exquisite food. And you go, but you're ready to, my wife and I are ready to get going. And, oh, no, very subtle, very quiet. We, you know. Oh, much more civilized. Oh, much more civilized. They had a period that was very, very uncivilized, but yeah. but that's very overly civilized now, you know. <laughs> Jeez. You functioned, uh, you had a couple albums under your own name, off and on. Yeah, I did. One was a mistake. I was called Jake Takes Manhattan. I was supposed to be Rosemary Clooney. Uh -huh. But uh, she didn't show, she could sick. Oh. And so we just put it together as, a, as an album. It was all off the top of our heads. Yeah. We never rehearsed a note, but we did it as we went along. We had Carmen Leggio, a very, very fine player on that. Danny Styles, guys you never heard, but it was their first and sometimes their only record day with that company, and Mike Moore, and John Bunch. Mm. You know, we just threw it together. Come out great. Well, you know, Carmen's father. still playing. Uh, yeah, he yeah, is. I sure yeah. like to see him in action. Yeah. See him at these parties or something. Boy, he's great. Yeah. He's soft as a grape, you know, but he's a great, great player, this guy. <laughs> he's a funny guy. Very funny guy. Well, let me play a uh, little snatch of a tune here and see if you can... One of the many records you've played on. Any idea? Too many records. Oh, that's great. It's nice on a trumpet. Nice. Huh? Yeah. yeah. That's uh, from the Triangle. Oh, who's all that? Who are all those guys? Who well, are they? Let's, uh, let's take a look. Yeah. Yeah, that was a thing we, for uh, Gus Johnson. Yep. That's for Gus Johnson. Randy Sankey. Oh, that, no wonder. Ralph. It's, yeah, no, Ralph. Chuck Hedges, Jake Hanna, Rick Fay, Dan Barrett. Dan Barrett, yeah, yeah. I know the trombone was good. The trumpet was just exceptional. Yeah. That was Randy, and he's playing even better now. Mm -hmm. You know that? Playing even better now. Yeah. Strong chaps. Yeah. Oh, yeah, better, better. Mm -hmm. Man, he's really got a good ear. Do you believe Connie Condoli in this thing? <laughs> I never heard music like that for years. Oh, boy, except out of him. Yeah. Boy, was he playing. Whew, man. Some player, that guy. Some player. We're on a ship. <laughs> Call from Tanner and him. And Pete, brother Pete. Yeah. Uh, Bob Cooper was alive then. Bob, Bob was playing myself. Randy Simpkins, Ross Tompkins. Nice. Yeah, they worked us a little too much in this boat. You know, I'm supposed to go once, once and back. But we were playing three times a day, and it was silly. But nobody ever showed up. But we only were eating, you know. Oh, first we get off the boat. We get off the boat. These two, they're two idiots, these guys. Confantana and Condoli. And they stand there, look at this big ship. It's Ensenada, you know. Went down Ensenada, and he says, Count. Count. He says, is that a U-boat up there? 
Is Ensenada my boat? Is that, that's what he's doing. We had to put up with this all week long. What you, <laughs> at a supper time, we're eating, and the, and the guy, and he, and he can write down how, what you thought of the food. You know, I said, oh, oh, okay, good, excellent, 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 everything was great, don't yeah. bother me. Count says, uh, the food was terrible and the portions were too small. <laughs> <laughs> He's a funny guy. Yeah. He? Oh, he's a funny guy. Oh, boy. Both the Condolis. Uh, oh, yeah, great with, guys. Yeah. Oh, they were with Herman, too, right? But yeah, yeah. With, were they on the Conte band? Conte was about 16 when he was with, when he back in the 40s with Dave Tuff was the drummer. Uh-huh. Yeah, so he remembers him well. And then he went back with a bop band. Bop band. I want to tell you a little story about Gene Krupp, what kind of a guy he was. Uh, not a, you know, not people to take him for granted. You know, Buddy Rich gets, worked so hard to be the king of the drums after Gene. Well, Gene Krupp was the king of the drums. He was uh -huh. the most famous drummer of all time. Yeah. Put everybody where they are now. <clears throat> Nicest guy ever lived. Uh, Buddy DeFranco said that too. He says he'd never worked with a better guy in his whole life than this guy. And Red Rodney told me a story. He was with Gene for quite a few years, you know. And he's the first guy he let play bop. Play whatever you want to play. He's the feature in The Man I Love, and he played bop. And then he says, hey, Gene, I got a chance to join Woody, you know, get a brand new band. And Shelly and all the guys, Don Lamar, who's up there? I forget who was there. He says, oh, yeah, that's okay. Woody got a hell of a nice new band. He says, okay, Red, it's a pleasure having you at the Madison a lot. Don, I know you did a lot for me. He says, you ever save any money? I know I've given you 200 a week. You know, everybody else making about $140. But he loved Red. So, no, I'm giving you two, 200. You ever save any money? Well, no, I spend most of it. But I get a couple of bucks so I can go get to join us. Well, I knew you'd blow it. He says, come on, back in the back, you know, with the back room. He brings out one of those little filing things, you know, like this, full of these little pay envelopes, you know, like this. He says, I put away 50 bucks a week for you. I was paying you 250 but I only gave you 200 So he wanted about a couple of thousand dollars so he could go out and join no Woody kidding. and run away. That's kind of a guy Gene Krupa was. Well, that's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> What's in the near future for you? Uh, we got this. What do we get after this month? Then we, next month we go to Japan, Harry Allen. Going to Japan with Harry Allen? Yeah, we got him, McKenna, Mike Moore, myself. Then they get a real nice guy lives near me. Kenny Burrell and Howard Allen, each with a trio, and then they play together. Then they get a band with Nicholas Payton, some tenor player, good alto player, and uh, Jeff Hamilton on the drums, John Clayton, Mike Ladon. They got a hell of a, they got about a sex, sex tet. Then they got Helen Merrill mm -hmm. and her little quartet, Terry Clark, an old pal of mine, he's going to be playing drums with her. And uh, let me see, they got, then our band, so that's one, two, three, four groups, four groups. So we, we were going to open up with a half an hour of our music. And now it's down to 20 minutes. So, <laughs> so Dave doesn't even want to go, you know. But we'll get him over there. We'll yeah. get him over. He's big pop. He's popular in Japan. But that's a nice, nice, nice concert thing. Yeah. And we're only there five days, and three of them are going to be in a club. So that's pretty good. So yeah. we'll be able to do some playing, see. I hear they like jazz in, in Japan a lot. Yes, they do. There's a contingent over here, 13 people over here. Yeah. Yeah, and they're going to they're gonna be there. They already made a dinner date. Always going to take us out. Now, we go out this night, you know. It's, <laughs> What do you mean? I haven't even eaten yet now. I'm still just trying to get my first course here, you know. They're already planning how to eat over there. Now, this is next month, you know. That's a Japanese version of strange guys. Oh, Dude, Lord. Yeah, funny guys. Well, you've had a marvelous career in, in jazz. Drumming. I've enjoyed every minute of it, you know? most of it, most of it. Well, well nine almost. years in Burke Griffin, you know. Yeah, that Which wasn't is... anything, but uh, that was an interrupt. It kept me off the streets. Because <laughs> the whole... Yeah, oh, everything faded at that time. Everything bottom fell out. And now, at least parts of Europe, I used to go over there every now and then, take off a weekend, take off a... He was very liberal about that, very nice about it. You can go anywhere, you take off anytime you want, go anywhere you want. Your job is yours and you come back. So that's kind of a guy he was, you know. Who was very that? Nice. I'm... Merv Griffin. Oh, Merv, yeah. Yeah, you can come, come back and do anything you want. I don't care what you do, you know. Just get a competent guy, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's great, you know. Yeah, made it, made it livable. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we had good, good bands, good guys in the bands, though. Yeah. And he wanted all-star bands. He did, you know. Yeah. Mondo Low left, he says, I got a great guitar player for him. But, you know, he doesn't have any hair. He wants all young-looking guys. So Danny Starr says, this guy's the best. He brought him to 
downbeat poles. He said, well, this guy went on the poles. Let me see what he looks like. Brought it in. It was Jim Hall. And he says, here's our new guitar player, Jim Hall. Come on out here. Let's do it to him. So he and then just did a tune around. He says, he says, you're hired. You know, yeah. So <laughs> another time come up, the band leader was always trying to get rid of some of the stars and get his guys on there. See, like, get oh. rid of me and get an, get his kid drummer on there. Yeah. So we, one time out in L.A., we went out there, we wanted to get this other guitar player from The Tonight Show on there, who happens to be very good, but Herbie Ellis got Joe Pass to come in, you know. And so Herbie and I went out to eat one night after Joe had done the job and gone out. Herbie says, you know, Jake, Mort says, Merv hated this guy because he had no hair. He was a oh. bald-headed guy. He just said, I don't know what to do. She says, now Mort's mad at me and he wants to get his guy on here. He says, well, that's what he wants to do. You listen to the more. Let's go to the lion. Let's go to the source. He said, oh, we can't talk to him. I said, who can't talk to him? Come on. Well, we left the brown derby. We went up backstage and rapped on the door. And Mary was sitting right by the door. He opened it up. He's in the conference with about 12 guys. He said, hey, Jake, how you doing? When would you get back? He says, just today. I just had supper with Herbie. He says, what's this? You don't like that guitar player he sent to me that night. Joe, Joe Pass. Said, Joe Pass. He says, what do you mean? He's, he's better than you are, Herbie. He says, you better be careful who you send in here from now on. That guy's the greatest. As you see, this guy was lying all the time. See, yeah. Herbie says, Jesus, always go to the top. Uh -huh. Well, word got around that he wasn't, uh, that uh, somebody was dissatisfied with him. They said you were dissatisfied with him. He says, you come to me when you get something to ask me, man. Don't ask somebody else. That's how he was. Cool. Yeah. He sounds like yeah, was very good at that, very good at that. Now, don't fool with him, because he'll chop your head off. <laughs> But he's very stick right by, you know. Yeah. If he's your enemy, you better leave. Uh huh. You better leave. No use hanging around. Right. Yeah. What's your opinion of uh, contemporary jazz these days? I don't know. I was, you know, not that. I'll get off it for a second there. But Coleman Hawkins made a very interesting statement one time. Rock and roll. What do you think of rock and roll? I was Vien, he says, there's nothing wrong with that music. It just it doesn't have the right people playing it. It's just straight eights. And sure enough, he was right. You know this guy, Elvis Costello? Yeah. Well, I'm watching a show one night, and it's from Ronnie Scott's. It's got Chet Baker with Elvis Costello. I said, what's this going to sound like? So he says, well, Chet did. You know all these students? I don't have to know the tunes. You just beat them off. But I don't want any drummer up there. And I, want the, and I don't want any guitar player up there. I want a bass player, but he's going to play this. And I want a keyboard, but he's going to play the piano. Now you play all your rock and roll stuff with those instruments. And you wouldn't believe how good it sounded. What he could make, he could make music out of like knocking that lamp over. Chet Baker's an absolute genius without even knowing it. Yeah. He played so great I couldn't believe it. And Elvis Costello sang it, it was very believable. And some of the most enjoyable music I ever heard, but he cut out the noise. Uh -huh. Chet eliminated all the noise. And the noisy drummers and the noisy loud bass. And the bass player was good. He could play it, played all the rhythms. And that's what I think of the contemporary <laughs> stuff. What he, if you get the right guy playing it, forget it. Uh -huh. You can get space guys playing. I heard a thing. I don't know what it's called, but I was riding in the car with Tony Bell, who happens to be over here now. And he's driving Mike Moore and I to a job in, in, uh, in England. And he played radio, and they were playing this whole thing by Gary Foster and Jimmy Roll. And they played the Peacock on there. And man, it was great. Now, if that's contemporary, I'm all for that, mm -hmm. but you know, Jimmy Rolls, yeah. he could do that in 1944. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's what he sounded like then. That's how good he was, yeah. that beautiful tone. He was just an advanced genius, yeah. period. Woody always thought that too, but mm -hmm. you know, they were going for Bill Evans trying to say, well, I had a guy that did that in 1944, you know, He's telling Alan Broadbent, he says, well, who's that? It's Jimmy Rolls. <laughs> His gal, Diana Crowell, you know her? Yes. She gets a very nice sound on the piano, very good time. She's mm -hmm. one of the best. But she's singing now, so I don't know what the hell that's about, you know. Right. But, uh, maybe that's how they're pushing her. Right. But uh, I think it's just a contemporary player. She has a couple of good guys working with her. But don't have any drums. They just have a big, yeah. like Nat Cole yeah, voicings, you know. Uh, 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 instrumentation, right. not voicings. <coughs> and uh, she, uh, uh, she was going to study. She was studying with Jimmy Rolls. And I played with her one night. You know, her mother and father says, will you play with him? Play behind my daughter somewhere. I said, sure, okay. So we played Dante's, and she's very thankful. And I said, What are you going to do now? I said, I'll go to Canada and study with Don Thompson. I said, But aren't you studying with Jimmy Rhodes? He says, Yeah, but you're not going to get a scholarship to study with this guy. He says, 
You know what it's gonna be like, honey? No, I hear these guys is gonna be like stepping off the top of the Empire State Building. Oh. And so I saw her about two years later, and I says, "How you doing? How'd you make out of Canada like that?" He says, "Oh, it was very thrilling. It was just like stepping off the top of." <laughs> she never forgot that line. She's yeah. a funny gal. Yeah. <laughs> just step on the top. Oh. No, you're right. Jimmy Rolls is where I should have stayed. I says, "Well, you're right. These guys are genius. <laughs> it's genius, Jimmy Rolls." Crazy as the day is long. Very funny man. Very funny guy. Very funny fellow. Well, I tell you, this has been a fascinating hour to speak to you. Well, thank you, Mo. I enjoyed your playing as much as your as your talking. Monk, monk row. I got a Sneed Hearn and Monk Row. I just love that. Jeez, what a great <laughs> name. What a great name. Where'd you come up with that name? Where'd, oh, it's a... a monk row. <laughs> is that your name you it's your a, folks it, gave it to you? No. It's a nickname. From Thelonious Monk. Well, no, actually. No? From a big blue coat I used to wear. There oh, I like it. a monk. But it is my real name now. It and is your real you name. If you insist on using it, you go right ahead, because I All know right, you'll I will, treat yeah. it with respect. Well, I've been passing myself off as Monk Eastman for years. Uh -huh. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's an old gangster out of New York, and the old, day, very famous gangster. <laughs> Dutch uh, Schultz and Monk Eastman, very big rivals. Okay. <laughs> well, on behalf of, the, behalf of the college, I want to thank you for the time. Well, my pleasure. I hope you have my a pleasure. great gig tonight. And uh, uh, what town is this in New York? Clinton, New York. Oh, Clinton, Hamilton, New York. Yeah. Hamilton well, college. from the canal, from the steamboat guy. Um, no, from uh, yes, he actually helped make he made the uh, helped make the Erie Canal and so forth. Yeah, uh, yeah He's named yeah. after Alexander Hamilton. Oh, 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 college, that no, but the town the is from the Clinton uh, yeah. Canal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you got a couple of good guys there. Yeah. Not contemporary, but uh, good. Yeah. <laughs> a very good guy, yeah. All right. All right, my pleasure. No kidding.